Hey, I'm Will. And I'm Sarah. This is our little podcast. About big plays. And this week, we are covering Tennessee Williams' masterpiece, Cat in the Hat. So close. Um, what? It's Cat in the Hot Tin Roof. That makes no sense, but okay. Well, they say it a million times in the play, they so... <laughs> Yeah, they really do, actually. <laughs> Well, great. What else are we going to talk about in this little podcast? Well, we're going to talk about Tennessee Williams' life. We're going to talk about the plot. We're going to talk about some themes. And we're going to... Cast the freaking play with some modern-day celebrities and some people we'd love to see in our dream cast. So stick around. Cue the theme music. you a happy valentine's day oh really oh thank you i know it's a day later but you know well, yeah we had a pretty good valentine's day though yeah we did and this is kind of like our valentine's episode we, it is it's not the most romantic of plays no. but it does center around a husband and wife yes and so actually a couple husband and wives actually three husbands and wives um very true yeah so there's a, a lot of little themes of like lust and love and stuff yeah, because we chose it because, um, you know, you see Elizabeth Taylor on the cover of most cat oh, on yeah, a hot tin yeah. roof type posters, she and she's in like movie. in like sassy like, like nighttime little, lingerie little, yeah, of the nineteen fifties little, 1950s, silk little dress or whatever nightgown. Yeah. Um. So I imagine it was going to be like a very sexy play. Because you we had never read it before no. this, which is sad. Yeah. But, um. But it's not. Terribly. It's not it's super really sad. It's really sad. Super sad. <laughs> yeah. And I um, can see, like, why, but, like, well, we'll get into it. Yeah. But, yeah. But, yeah, it's a good choice. We, you know, we threw around a couple different choices, yeah. like Romeo and Juliet. We thought we could dive into some Shakespeare. I was like, William, I don't want to be that cliche that we're going to choose Romeo and Juliet. No, so we went you. the opposite. So we went Tennessee Williams. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Who um, I think wanna... is one of the most romantic writers. You think? Yeah, but in, in like opinion. a in like a, but not in like a in like a like sexy way like a. No, I just think he uses like language really beautifully. Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, that that is that is true. Yeah, the way that his characters talk is very distinct. Yes, yeah, they for go sure. on and on, but in a oh beautiful my way. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So, uh, do you want to get into a little bit of about Tennessee Williams? I do. I do, in fact. Yeah, I feel like we should do all like this. All the plays take place in the South. And, Southern draw. Uh, New Orleans. and I miss and Savannah. Where is Cat and Hot Tin <laughs> Roof even set? Oh, it's Mississippi, isn't it? Mm. They go to Ole Miss. Oh, That's I don't remember. That's the college remember. that they that Brick went to. It probably is Mississippi. Anyway. But our boy, Tennessee Williams, actually was named Thomas Lanier Williams the third. And Wait. his pen name is Tennessee Williams. Yeah, his his friends started calling him that in college, I think. Yeah, I love yeah. when a person has a pen name. I don't uh, know. I just feel like that. What was it Thomas? Yeah, definitely Tennessee's. Tennessee's way, way cooler. Way cooler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he is considered one of the most like foremost playwrights of the 20th century in regards to American drama. I'm sure if For you've sure. been listening to our podcast, you have heard us mentioned tennessee williams i remember one, one too many times i remember once when you we were talking about arthur miller and you're like Ugh, i hate when people mention arthur miller and tennessee williams because they're just like cliche and i'm like yeah but well, for the, a reason yes they are the foremost dramatic writers on um, the 20th century yes um but he was born in columbus mississippi yes and his sense. father was a traveling sa shoe salesman and an alcoholic Huh. So, that doesn't come up ever in his writing. <laughs> uh, yes. What problem relationships with your father? Come on, <laughs> Never. alcoholism. Or your family? Yeah, so come I thought on. it was important to go into like his yeah, family he's, history. He's very uh, autobiographical in his writing. Yeah. So, um, he lived with his mother and her parents, and he had two siblings. Um, and as a child, he was very weak with something called. I'm going to butcher this, and I'm so sorry. Uh, diphtheria? 
diphtheria. Diphtheria? Dip, diphtheria. Diphtheria. I yes. think. Yeah, that's what I've heard it called. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard P, not a soft P. No, it is. Even though the spelling would say different things. Yeah, it would imply oh. otherwise. Um, diphtheria, which left him weak and bedridden for like a year, and his father, being the kindest man on the planet, he actually would beat him because he what? didn't think he was being tough enough for a boy at his age. The beatings will continue until morale improves. Yes. Kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, and the mother tried to like protect him, but you know, so she stayed like in the unhappy marriage because like what? that was someone a staying of in an unhappy marriage. <laughs> that probably has something to do with the play that we're going to talk about it's today. Crazy. Yeah. Um, his father finally got a steady job in St. Louis, so they all moved there. But his hey, that's mother. That's just down the road. Yeah. Fun. Close by. Yeah. His mother like struggled to find like a safe place to live in St. Louis, so they kept moving like from <laughs> place to place. So they moved like numerous times, like in St. Louis. Moral of the story: St. Louis is terrible. It it is kind of spooky. I I was considering SLU when I was looking at colleges. And East then... St. Louis is like one of the most dangerous parts of any town. Probably. Yeah. Um, um, our so cat right? is coming on the bed. So yeah. Are you in the shot? Say hi. No, no I don't think he's <laughs> Well, he's right there. Oh, please don't. Don't mess it up. Okay, so Oh, he... there's a tail. <laughs> <laughs> Adventures in video podcasting. We love it. Okay. Uh, he entered many writing contests in school, so he always had kind of a knack for it, nice. and he did it on like casually on the side. He won third place for an essay titled The Good Wife. Oh. I'm so sorry. It was titled, Can a Good Wife Be a Good Sport? Cool. Um, but it really didn't lead to anything. You know, he was like, it was just Except casually writing. writing. No, I'm just kidding. Well, he didn't know that at the time. Okay. So he attended University of Missouri in Columbia, and he was a journalism major. Mm. So it's like, what can I do with my writing, but also be, you know, get paid for it? Practical. Practical, yes. Come on, Tennessee. Um, but legend says he was mostly into college because he was in love with some girl and didn't really focus on his studies at the time. Um, now, who's that's what that? Legend says. Who is that? Uh, who does that? Who does that remind you of? Are you, you talking about me? I'm talking about me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, um, I did very well in school. I think my grades went down when I started dating you, particularly in one class. That's like the nicest thing you've ever said. I remember I was date. We were dating. It was like maybe the first semester we were dating. I was taking this really hard history class, and I got like a D on a paper, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> like this is like the worst I'd ever done." And I was like, "It was like my last, my senior year." And I was like, You're "Like Sarah, I was spending too much time with Sarah. I need to actually do my homework." <laughs> it was admittedly a horrible paper. So, um, well, I'm so sorry. This That's is okay. a formal apology. It's okay. I went even went to the professor. I was like, "What can I do?" And he's like. You're a senior. I'm not going to... What? No. So, but I got my grade up at the end of the semester, so... I got like stopped a, hanging out for I got a like an A on the final, kidding. so I was, like, I was like, I have to get a good grade on this. Oh, anyway. my gosh. Sorry. All right. Well, he... Uh, Tennessee couldn't give up his little writing career um, just yet, so to make a quick extra buck, he entered many writing competitions on campus, and he actually did pretty well. He was the first freshman to receive honorable mention in a writing competition. Um, but his dad forced him to leave school because he's like, you're not doing that great and you need to earn money for the family. So work in a shoe factory. Um, he hated it. So he actually, this made him like focus on his writing religiously because that was kind of like his outlet. He was so unhappy at the shoe factory and he had a nervous breakdown at age 24. He quit the shoe factory, but he did draw upon his experience there. Um, like in his writing, can you guess what character is drawn from that? Stanley Kowalski. Yes, 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 yes. William. And ding, even, ding, ding. And even and even he met a guy named Stanley Kowalski in the factory. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it's like a real person he knew. Now, how based on how based like on the actual character it is, it's probably a little different. But there was definitely a guy named Stanley Kowalski. That's amazing. Yeah, that's Streetcar Named Desire for all those who are unfamiliar. Which we will cover that someday. It is one of my favorite plays, William Scared. Stella. We'll do it. Um, great. So that's kind of um, after that, after he started finding like those characters and focusing on his writing, that's when his career really took off. 
Um, he kind of wrote like his big plays like pretty early on. So we have the, yeah. So he's got the three like yeah, the three big ones. The trifecta. Yeah? Name them. Yeah. Okay, we got Streetcar. That came first, right? Yes, I think so. Okay, streetcar Name Desire, Glass Menagerie. No, uh, yeah. Mm. I don't, I don't know the order. Yeah, me them. either. And then great, we should probably know that. Probably uh, Glass Menagerie, <laughs> and then of course Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Yes. And actually, cat. I'm sorry, I almost slipped off the camera. Um, cat on a hot tin roof. Um, was his favorite play that he ever wrote. You know, we missed an opportunity when Sawyer came up on the bed to talk about that cats and yeah stuff. Dang it. Oh well. Oh, uh, that was planned. <laughs> We've been working on that all day, Sawyer. <laughs> cat on a hot tin roof, more like cat on a shaky bed. Sure. Um, but then after he wrote like his trifecta, which. Uh, both Glass Menagerie and um, Streetcar yeah. won Pulitzer Prize for drama. And I think... I think, yeah, Cat, Cat did. And, Cat yeah, did too. Cat and the Hot Tin Roof um, did as well. But after that, he was kind of like, height of his career. But then he kind of turned, you know, to drinking really? and uh, drugs. And he was exploring, like, his sexuality a lot. Um, but you know, back then it was obviously like yeah. that was a negative connotation kind of tied to it. And so he was struggling with that in his personal life. And then also his sister, um, which some of his characters are based off of, especially in Glass Menagerie. Yeah. Um, very out of I mean, he's Tom. In Glass yeah. Menagerie, you know? Yeah. But she actually had to go into, um, a mental institution because she had schizophrenia and um and i think something else but so he actually had to take care of her and she got like the best kind of care because um she had her good old tennessee williams looking out for her but um he made that, a little bit of money from his place yes just, just a little bit <laughs> just a little bit um but he was very close with her and that was like really hard on him because she just kind of as you know as she grew older it got worse and yeah yeah so that was really hard um so he actually like the his later plays he tried like a new different writing style that didn't feel like very him because he got kind of lost in himself and that like showed up in his work and so critics were really like oh this is bad you're doing a bad job tennessee you're not pulling through yeah after this because he he has what rose tattoo mm -hmm. and then night of the iguana and then like one other one and that's about it talk to me like a rain let me listen well, no yeah, he has like act, quite yeah. a few Really? Yeah, he does have quite like a lot, but they all like didn't do well, um, which I just thought was Wait. interesting. Because yeah. mm. um, you always think Tennessee Williams, you know, everything must be a hit. But he like hit hit early on and then fizzled out a little bit. And he died, you know, pretty young. Nineteen eighty three. He yeah. died. What did yeah. he die of, Will? Oh, I looked this up. Well, wait, do oh you don't want to talk about Elliot Kazan first? Oh, you had that of written. Of course right? I do. Yeah. Um. So, Elia Kazan. Elia Kazan. Um, I love him. If you have listened to Playbirds before, I talk about my crush is this director. Um, and he actually directed quite a few of Tennessee Williams' like big ones. I think he directed like all of the trifectas at one point. So total dreamboat of a director. Um. But he did the original production in 1955, and um, then there was a revival of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Sorry, he directed Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, but and in, Streetcar. And, the and movie Streetcar. Streetcar. And the movie. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. we're going to focus on Cat. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, the revival of it in 1974, in this production, uh, Williams restored much of the text he had to remove um, back in the 1950s when it wasn't like as acceptable. Um, but he was urged by Elia Kazan to be like, hey, dude, you should put this back in. It's like, mm -hmm. it's so important to the plot. Like, it doesn't, like, the play barely, it makes sense, obviously, but, like, it has so much more depth with all of the text that you, like, pulled right. out. And so with, like, the encouragement from him um, and the actors who are working on um, the revival, they all kind of got to work together, and that's where the newer text um, that came with the revival came from. So it was a very kind of collaborative effort, which mm. I do love that like Tennessee trusted those actors enough to be like, oh, you feel like that character should say that there? Great, let's put it in. Yeah. You know, um, which I just think like, wow, 
that rehearsal process must have been like a dream come true. A dream. Hashtag dream. Yeah. Though. Um. So his death. Oh yes. Yeah, sorry. So we digress. He yeah. died. So he died. In 1983. He, 1983. He choked. Well, allegedly. Here's here. There, there's a little bit of drama and mystery surrounding this. His his uh, agent, I guess, said that he died choking on a bottle cap. Mm-hmm. Okay, like a like a, like an eyedropper like bottle cap was like stuck in his throat. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. He was seventy one. He was seventy one. So I mean, you know, getting up there, but probably had a few years left. Anyway, um, but what probably really happened is he died from an overdose, like an accidental overdose of this sleep inducing drug that he had been taking for years. He uh, mm. like had built up a tolerance to it, most likely, and and was just like taking more and more of it, and that killed him um which is super sad um and then he wanted to be buried at sea because his like one of his favorite authors or poem, yeah, poet yeah it's a favorite poet yeah yeah had like literally committed suicide in the ocean by jumping off a cruise ship in i didn't realize yeah. it was because of suicide i thought he no. was like scattered at sea no no no, no 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 this is in his will it said it said not even scattered at like yeah. not even his ashes scattered. He wanted to be like put in like a canvas bag and then thrown off a boat oh. in the middle of like the Caribbean Sea. I don't love that it's, actually. It's actually crazy. But his brother didn't allow that to happen yeah. and he got he's buried in St. Louis. Yeah, buried next to his mother. There you go. Um who he had a complicated relationship with. Sure. So sure. was it the way he wanted to you go? You wanna know you wanna know more about Tennessee Williams' mother? Just read Glass Menagerie. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Tennessee, one of my favorite quotes that he, um, that I found of just like how he viewed theater, cause it was very much like an outlet that he could find like joy in his life, mm. which, um, I certainly can relate to, but he says the laughter enchanted me then and there the theater and I found each other for better or for worse. I know it's the only thing that saved my life. So I just love that. Where, you know, he did it to, like, impact the audience and he felt that connection and, mm. like, sure. and that's what gave him purpose. And I think that's just stunning. That's beautiful. Anyways. Should so we get that's, into... That's Tennessee that's Williams Tennessee, for you. Yeah. That was a very kind of short overview. Um, But like we said, like, you really, well, when that's you short. read his works you thought you feel him yeah he's very present and every everyone who's ever like worked on his plays like especially back in the day they're like yeah you do tennessee one of his plays you do his life basically yeah, yeah. right what you he's know. all he's all over it yeah so, so yeah we can great. move on great um all right so let's get into a little bit about what this play is about and the time period it's set it's set in 1955-ish 1950s um in the south it uh centers a lot around alcoholism and kind of the um breakdown of the husband and wife relationship especially uh and father and son but and sexuality well yeah sure 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 but it centers over yeah it centers around all that kind of stuff for sure so, um, the 1950s are, like, known for, like, this, like, I don't know, kind of classic time period in American history, right? So, it's, like, it's like after World War II, no, nobody has any problems anymore. The sitcoms are all, like, leave it to Beaver and, you know, Father Knows Best and all that kind of stuff. And that was, like, a real thing of, like, the, the media is painting the American family as, like, this perfect this perfect thing mm-hmm. whereas uh it, behind closed doors things are really not uh that good a lot of alcoholism um and a lot of just like i don't know brokenness i guess in tennessee williams certainly grew up with that and wanted to bring it out in this play um i thought it was interesting how like uh i don't know if this has any, these two plays have anything to do with each other but like but like come back little shiva was produced in 19 first produced in 1950 mm. This was produced just five years later. I don't know if that has, if that's relevant, but I thought that was interesting. Come back, sure. little, Sh- uh, little Shiva is about alcoholism and a family. Yeah, yeah, and that's much more like pronounced man. for sure. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, good plot. Plot. Okay, characters, right? So you got Maggie, and Brick. Those are husband and wife, right? I always think his name's Brink for some reason. Nah, he is on the brink of collapse. Um. 
they have uh they have no children they um, don't have sex they don't have sex she a, wants a, it he doesn't she's dr- like for the entire first act she's like trying to seduce him yeah um they are it is also they are staying in his parents house mm-hmm. his parents are big big daddy and big mama and very southern names. very southern names right yeah you never actually get their real names do you they no. just call it that's that's all they call each other right yeah and yeah. like big daddy and big mama refer to each other as big daddy and yeah. big mama which yeah, i was like super weird woof um, anyway, so it's Big Daddy's birthday, 65th birthday. Um, Big Daddy and Big Mama actually hate each other. No, sorry. Big Daddy hates Big Mama, mm-hmm. has, like, this really, like, profound, like, hate for her and is pretty vocal about it. Uh, you don't think so? I mean, I think it just stems from, like, uh, he feels like his life is behind him. He holds, like, a resentment, like – he kind of, I feel like he blames her for like lost years. Like, I don't he know could. if it's like. He even says like, he even says like, I, ne- I never liked her. I never, yeah. like, I never even like, I, cu- I couldn't bear to look at her. But then he yeah. offers his arm. So you get mixed signals where I don't sure. think it's like, I don't think he purely hates his wife. I think right. it's a but little she, more nuanced. But it is, it is very clear that she's very devoted to him. Mm-hmm. And he could like, kind of could take her a lever at best. At this point, yeah. At this point, okay. And then he just beat cancer. Yeah. 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 Or so they think. Yes. So yeah, he gets a doctor's report back, and like, yeah, the doctor's like, "Oh my gosh, he's cancer free." And then you've got the other couple who is Gooper, mm-hmm. which I thought it was Cooper for the longest time, but it's Goop. Like, it's Gooper, and, and then May. May, and Gooper is Brick's older brother. Yes. Um, Brick is like the favorite son. Gooper's kind of like the the nerd. Nerd like. Yeah. Kind of nervous. Kind of like yeah. his wife has like a big mouth on her, so she'll yeah. like do all the talking for him. Yeah. Can May, you relate? Or? No. <laughs> um, and then May is like to Maggie, right? Is like the opposite of Maggie. May is yeah. like this like symbol of like fertility, basically, because oh she gosh. has she's like she's like incredibly pregnant through the entire play. She has three, three kids already. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot to do with like broken marriages and. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So, those are the characters, and then the plot is it's all taking place in one room. In Brick has uh, broken his ankle or something the night before, so he's on crutches the entire time. Yeah. And it's Big Daddy's birthday, and they it's it's this it's a bunch of just like super long drawn out conversations. It's really only like three scenes. Mm-hmm. Like they don't. It's not even really broken up into like smaller scenes. Like three big yeah. acts. Act I- one is almost all between brick and maggie Maggie. maggie's trying to seduce him Mm -hmm. act two is uh the birthday party right yeah yeah yeah. and so yeah they bring like the whole birthday party up to uh to brick's room and the conversation between brick and his dad yes and then at at the end yeah yeah they 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 talk and like they have this big long conversation and then act three um it's just I, everyone coming to terms with all everything that just happened. Yeah. So act one, I just want to give like the big points. So the inciting incident um, is that Brick had a friend, a very close friend named Skipper. They played football together and um, everyone kind of thought their relationship was like a little too close. It was a little off. Um, even Maggie suspected it. So she tried to seduce Skipper um, to like, and then when it didn't really work out, she was like, see, Skipper, you're gay and you're in love with my husband. And so and then Skipper started to kind of believe like he was gay and in love with her husband, even though like that might have been the case. It might have not. But it got him kind of thinking. And so then he calls um, Brick and he's like confesses his feelings for him. And Brick just hangs up the phone. And then um, Skipper actually kills himself. Mm hmm. So that all takes place before the play. Right. So Brick is like, is really mad at Maggie and kind of hates her because um, that was like his closest friend in the world. And he blames her and also blames himself for what happened. So he drinks so he can hear that like click in his head when everything goes peaceful because he can't live with himself until that moment happens. So yeah, he is an unabashed alcoholic. Yeah. Just constantly drinking. Barely says, I think he might have, like, ten lines in the first act because Maggie's just going off and he's just drinking. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Um, So Maggie 
is trying to seduce him. She's trying to say everything that's going wrong with, like, the family and how, like, uh, they don't see her like they should. And, you know, so it's very much about, like, their relationship in Act 1. And then you move into Act 2, and then you get to meet everyone. And you see just how much, like, Big Daddy, everyone wants Big Daddy's approval because he has the huge estate. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're very rich. It's like yes. a plantation. Yeah, so everyone's kind of fighting over it because when they were like, oh, no, he might have cancer. He might die soon. Who's going to get his estate? Going to jump on that. Um, And he actually, what Big Daddy doesn't know and Big Mama doesn't know, because it's kind of one of the other big secrets of the play, is that his cancer actually is still there and it's really bad and he's probably going to die soon. Um, I don't know why they... That, that that was never confused, clear. It, yeah, it confused me because like the doctors like lie mm-hmm. to to Big Mom and Big Daddy, but they tell the kids. Yeah, they tell the kids because like Maggie Whatever. tells him in Act One, and I thought she was just like messing with him. So did I. Because I don't know, <laughs> I was like, that's a terrible thing to mess with someone about. But it is. I kind of thought that. Um, but it hey. turns out it's true. Um, so they're trying to hide that he has cancer. They were trying to work out how to tell it. And then Big Daddy kicks everyone out because he's, like, annoyed with everyone. And then he calls Brick in. And they have a father-son chat where, you know, Big Daddy kind of makes him come to terms with his sexuality a little bit. And so much so that Brick gets pissed and tells him that he has cancer. And confesses. And confesses that, like, yeah, I'm gay. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Uh. So that conversation is – it. It's really interesting because, I don't know, I'm going to plow through this plot real quick before we get into it. Oh, but, sure. And then Act 3 is them telling um, Big Mama and the rest of the people still think that Big Daddy like doesn't know that he has cancer. Um, so Brick is like beside himself out on the back deck and everyone's just like trying to console Big Mama because they just told her and... It's just the estate. They want it to go to Maggie and Brick. So Maggie's like, I'm pregnant. She's not. Um, she's not pregnant, in fact. You don't and think so? <laughs> no. I don't think it's ever in question. <laughs> no, yeah, she is definitely not. And and even and May, like, freaks out because she knows sure. she's not. But the parents are like, oh, thank God, because we love Brick the most. So he gets the estate. Right. And then Maggie and Brick hook up at the end. Or maybe. do they? Um, and that's the play. That's the play. So let's jump into like some themes. Um, a big one is that they use this word, mendacity. 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 Menopause. No, mendacity. Yeah, you should speak on menopause, though. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't gonna speak on it. I was just saying it. Uh, mendacity. Men- mendacity. Oh my gosh, why can't I say it? Uh, yeah. will you tell us? what that means it's like living in a bed of lies uh and like being like surrounded by lies and liars and brick feels like he is surrounded by that but it's it's well no he is confessing that like he's the liar i felt like he was trying Mm -hmm. to get big daddy to like understand like he was trying to say like uh like big daddy like you're just you know what big daddy's like pressing him i'm like what's bothering you like what's going on with you kid Mm -hmm. you know and he says, like, oh, it's this mendacity that I have to – and Big Daddy takes it the wrong way. It's like, oh, you're surrounded by lies and liars? And really it's Brick trying to say, like, no, I'm, I'm the, the one. Liar. I'm the one yeah. who's living a lie. And who and I've just, like, been trying to, like, force it down, like, for the for my entire life, basically. Yeah, um, yeah so. And then um, – no, I think that – but – it is kind of like reversed for Big Daddy, which is interesting. So like Brick There's that feels like that... he's the liar, right? Um, and then Big Daddy's actually surrounded by all the liars. By, yeah, because everybody knows the truth except for him and Big Mama. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So, uh, I thought, I mean, Tennessee just did like a, you know, kind of covered all the bases: how you like lie to yourself and how you lie to others. Right. It's um, just a, a big web of disgusting. Yes. Lies. Um, it's great. No, and then another, uh, I guess I just wanted to talk about, like, uh, repression and, like, how important, like, Brick's 
character is in like literature and uh, like for the 1950s, like for that time and like moving sure. forward. Um, so, you know, because he's supposed to be kind of like this picturesque, like hot boy jock. You know, everyone wanted to marry him. He's the most eligible bachelor. He's right. like he's like a sports star too. Yeah, like he was like a, a college football player at Ole Miss, got hurt or something mm-hmm. in, in his college years, couldn't play anymore, has become like this kind of like big time sports announcer. Yeah. And so he, you know, he's kind of like the picture of desire, if you will. Um, yeah. And yeah. so for him to like have those like um, homosexual like feelings, it was just like so, um, so uncommon if you will that people thought when really it was a lot more common uh than people actually like realized like because at the people time. were repressing it yeah they're repressing it there's so much judgment on it and so it's you know tennessee was like one of the first people to kind of write about like this picturesque type of guy and he's he like, wrote about it like very openly too, yeah you know yeah um and yeah. like Brick- more than i thought would be in this play me I too. thought it was going to no be much, much more, it. like, beneath everything. Yeah. You know? But it was, like, it's, like, pretty brought out. Right. Now, we watched a, pr- a production of the of the later version, like, the 1974 mm-hmm. version. So it's got, like, some, like, F-bombs in it and all that kind of stuff, which I was like, whoa. And then <laughs> I was like, I was like. Traumatized. I, well. No, I get Yeah, it. I was just I wasn't mean, yeah. expecting that. There were, like, three or four. And I was like, shoot. Yeah, and they came so casually. We were like, well. Yeah. Um, but, and he, and, like, Brick is, like, ashamed that he's, like, a queer. Like. Oh, my gosh. He yeah. doesn't want to be. otherwise, other, and he's ashamed that he drove his friend to suicide, yeah. basically. By basically, like, denying those feelings that, like, he couldn't even admit to himself. And because he couldn't even at least do that, he couldn't possibly do it to his friend. And so then his friend died um so it's like so tragic and sad so like tennessee is writing this like tragic hero almost that like and it, yeah he, he is yeah. completely because he's he's supposed to be at the top of his game but yeah. you know throughout the course of the play he's already been broken because he's broke his ankle the night before mm-hmm. broke his ankle running high school like he was at his high school like track and field fields or whatever the track and it was trying to jump hurdles yeah right he breaks his ankle, so he's he's literally broken, and then like physic like emotionally by the end of the show, broken. And so, yeah, I I don't know. That was just um, I I would really love to like work on this play and really study the relationship between like Brick and his dad. Um, yeah, just it's like not in like, the rehearsal room. I just oh think gosh, that'd be yeah. so like interesting to like pull out um unfortunately i don't feel like it's done very often anymore i know it's got such a big cast for like a professional like uh, other than broadway you're not gonna find it like if they do like a broadway revival of it it's not that big i mean maybe like because there's a few more characters we haven't covered but yeah there's like a preacher and there's like a whatever like a doctor and like some servants and the kids yeah it's it's not obviously it's not impossible to put on but it's just not as common right as right. obviously like glass menagerie you can do with what is it four people mm-hmm. so yeah so i don't know it's a lot of like this play deals with a lot of like uh the characters are unsure they're repressed but they're outspoken right um so it's just kind of a lot going on one of my favorite lines that they use like multiple times this is actually the last line of the show um, and it kind of goes back to, like, truth and lies, um, was that when Maggie says to Brick at the end, like, I do love you, and then Brick goes, wouldn't that be funny if it were true? Yeah. that's. And that's the last line of the show. And Big Daddy says like... the same thing to Big Mama when she confesses her love. Oh. So it's like, these people don't think they can accept love. Or because they're imperfect themselves. They or... think it's the love's a lie because the person doesn't actually know them. Oh, sure. Could be a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just I just found that to be really interesting. Yeah, there's so much in this play. Do you wanna we haven't even like touched on like Maggie at all. 
who is the self-proclaimed <laughs> cat on a hot tin roof. I think it's funny that he named the play Cat in the Hot Tin Room because I don't even see it's, this as Maggie's story. It, I know. And in Act 1, you feel like it's going to be because right. she is she dominates Act 1. Mm-hmm. She is trying to seduce Brick. She is um, um, trying to just get like, a rise out of him. I don't even know if it's like purely anything. seduced. Just like get something to like show that he cares, show right. that, you know. Right. I don't know. Um, and so and then and then for the rest of the play, she's like hardly in it. Yeah. You know, I mean, like acts like the obviously like the back half act two, she's not. But right. I, I was very shocked by that. I thought she was going to be much more of a Blanche Dubois kind of figure. What's our uh, favorite line, Will? Uh, Maggie, why are you so catty? Well, because I'm not, uh, maybe I'm Maggie the cat. I'm a cat on a hot tin roof. No, why she just she... says, I'm a cat. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, I just laughed at it. I know. But it's, she... like, it's like you, uh, it's, I wasn't expecting them to say cat on a hot tin roof at all in the show. And they said it like three times. Oh, my God. More, I think more than that. Yeah, yeah. That was crazy. Yeah, I hate because like because like, I know, I know. I don't know if he like set out. He was like, "Ooh, I'm gonna call this cat on Hudson Roof," or like that. Like, just kind of came about. Like, "Ooh, I'll like I've I've written this like, into the play. Maybe I'll just call it Cat on Hudson Roof." But I feel like he didn't have to put it in there at all. It's mm-hmm. pretty obvious why he wants to call it that, right? A cat on a Hudson Roof. It's it can't get a footing. It uh, it's jumping all around. Yeah. It's nervous. It's uh, very like it feels threatened by its surroundings. You mm-hmm. know all that kind of stuff. It's like yeah, like that's a great name for a play. Right. You need to put it in there. Not that I'm questioning the great t- Tennessee Williams. I well, I think I am just because like I I feel I see this very much as like Brick's story. Um. It yeah, it for sure is. And so. It it is weird where it insinuates like it's about Maggie when it's really not, and I don't know. In my right. humble opinion, I just I don't get the title. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of Brick's name? Um. A real. It, I think in the stage directions, he's it says a real brick of a man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like sounds like hard. I mean, he's supposed to be like the picture of manliness, you know. Brick. Brick. Ugh. Um. In one of Rick Reynolds. in one of Tennessee Williams' footnotes in the play, um, in his many drafts, he said, "This is a play which says only one affirmative thing about man's fate: that he has it still in his power not to squeal like a pig, but to keep a tight mouth about it." So you know, like all these people feel like mm. uh, they're losing power; they want to win the estate or they want to like have control. So but, there is control and secrets. Yeah, there's control and secrets of like, hmm. um, and holding that power like over each other. Right. That's what you can right. control in the room. Interesting. Yeah. So I was like, huh. I Tennessee, never thought about that. Tennessee Williams, his little his notes and his stage directions are incredible in this play. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a bi- he has he has like a big long stage direction, uh, in the second act when Brick is about to like really let loose on Big Daddy. And it's just like this whole paragraph of just uh, of just like this is this is like beads of sweat have been pouring down Brick's <laughs> like face. And it's like and and this is this is the pinnacle moment of the play and stuff like that. And you just like it's it's crazy because you just like don't really see that anymore in modern yeah. writing. Every All the state all those stage notes are like stage directions are like the most minimal that you can have. And it's and it's it's actually. Yeah, they're so it's so beautiful, actually, the way Tennessee like. Kind of just lays it all out for you, um, right? And it doesn't feel restricting. So I feel like that's why playwrights no, like nowadays, all. where it's like, well, we want to give the actors like the creative choices to like go where they feel like the character should go. You know, sure. Um, which I could see why there's not as many stage directions, but like Tennessee, there's like, uh, by kind of giving that insight, you know, there's so much more to explore, like, as the actor, like, go in that direction. Um, yeah. Because he writes it in a way that's not as, like, now <laughs> you cry. And, like, right, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So. No, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of symbols in this play as well. You want to get into. I would love to get into symbols. symbols. So this is another box set, which we talked about last week, um, where 
the whole play takes place in one room on you know in one area you don't have to change sets or anything it's yeah. nice um this but is, it, this is brick and maggie's room that they're bedroom in. yes bedroom yes. um and it's important that there's it's in the bedroom and even M- big mama refers to it because classic tennessee williams he loves a good symbol he will point it out he where will. she refers to the bed and she was like these are where the rocks of marriage lie and it's in um the bed uh in intercourse in children and the, in... <laughs> and the bed is owned by it was like it was it's like an heirloom or like it's like it was in the old house or whatever like so it's the plantation the, and... yeah so some of the landowners uh from previous like uh before they owned it obviously it was actually uh these two males it was their bed so they were gay with each other <laughs> It doesn't um, – They were partners? They were partners, yeah. It's a similar thing where, like, yes, we can assume that as much, but they said their relationship huh. wasn't as natural or seemed oh, off okay, to okay, everyone. Okay, okay. Um, I'll say. So, yeah. So I just thought that was kind of interesting of Tennessee to throw in there. Um, I know. But, he loves doing that stuff. But the original owners of the plantation were named Jack Straw and Peter Ocello. I think, like, Othello? Yeah, maybe. No, not really. No, I don't know. Um. As William writes, the ghost of the men's love haunts the stage. Dun, dun, dun. A classic Tennessee symbol. That, oh, my gosh, for sure. Um, and then another symbol we have is, like, the radio phonograph, um, like, television liquor cabinet that, like, towers over the room. Um, so we, we saw, when we saw the production, it was, like... It- the middle of the stage was the bar. It was. It wasn't as towering in that production yeah, as, as it probably, as it probably have should have been. been. And I didn't even get that actually the radio is a part of it. Yeah. And that he's like t- constantly turning the radio on and off. I don't think he was in that production, was he? I saw, there was a radio. There was? Yeah, and yeah. He, it, was, it was like they would play music in the background? Yeah. Okay. Or I know it, it was more like a like, – like, like a static? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, but he notes that it serves as a shrine to the comforts and illusions behind which we hide things uh, that the characters are facing. Hmm. So, Great. alcohol. Do you ever hide things uh, when you're drinking? Or <laughs> no? What uh, what a question. I don't know. I. <laughs> <laughs> you have to answer that. Thanks. Um, finally, we should note Brick's phallic crutch. Phallic. Yes. It's removal. Why? Why? Okay. It's removal at the hands of Maggie and Brick. Oh, and, and Big Daddy. Sorry. When yeah, they, they take it from him. Brick, it symbolizes his castration. A castration. Um, interesting. I don't. Interesting. With the revelation of his unmanly homosexual desires. But he also, like, uses it as a weapon. Yeah, but when they take it from him and he's, like, at his lowest and we see him as this, like, small yeah. man, yeah. That's those are at points where those people are challenging, like, his manliness, um, you know, and his sexuality. And he's using – and he's trying to use his manliness to, to gain them. an advantage. Yeah. And then when – in those times where he's, like, trying to hurt them, that's when he's, like, the weakest. Because it's not rooted. Gotcha. You know? Great. Um. Yeah, the continuous restoration and removal is a sort of game. Now he has it, now he doesn't, you know, of his sexuality. Now he's taking ownership of it, now he doesn't huh. have it. Great. Um, so, yeah, so those uh, are kind of my symbols I kind of uh, thought about. Could you think of any? Those are those are these symbols. <laughs> I, you took them all. <laughs> I was going to, yeah. No, good. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You spark notes, master. That's me. Well, also Tennessee makes it very clear yeah, in I mean, the play. Sure, sure. Where, yeah, it's it's kind of easy to find a t- Tennessee symbol. Oh yeah. Sometimes it's a storm. Sometimes, <laughs> it's a streetcar named Desire. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. No. Um. No, I don't have. I no. That's... Now, Will, did you like this play? Okay. Here, that's a super good question. Um, I did. I did not like it as much as I thought I would. I thought it was going to be, like I said, like much more like uh, nuanced, I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is very nuanced. But, you know, I thought it was going to – I thought there was going to be a lot more layers to, like, peel back in terms of Brick and Maggie. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that's unfair because I was bringing my preconceived notions into it. Um, but, yeah, like, would I want to be in this play? Actually, that's a great question. 
Or do you would I want to be yourself? brick? I don't think I don't think I would want to be brick. You'd be more of a gooper. Well, sure. I wouldn't want to be <laughs> gooper either. I'd be like, eh, like I'll pass actually. Um, um, I don't think I don't think being brick would be like very fun or like fulfilling for me it would be just like really sad and i don't i'm not like that kind of actor i don't think it's more of like a i'll be the cat in the yeah, hat I think someone gay should play brick yeah yeah that would make sense yeah do you feel like that's a a, a a must i i do believe so because i think there's much more for someone uh to draw upon if they're like yeah, how do you feel about? Gay. How do you feel about? Yeah, how do you feel about like that in general? Like, I think I feel because there's so many gay men in theater, by people, at, or yeah, that's true. You know, like, give them those roles. That's who they're written for. So, yeah, I would give the opportunity like more to them Gordon than in to the like. Prom? Don't get me started. <laughs> um, <laughs> then straight men, um, because it's, it's just not their story. Yeah, and they can't really relate to it. Yeah, not you as know. not as well as you might yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. But then that gets into the whole like, well, I've never been a drug addict. Does that mean I can't be a drug addict on stage? Well, those aren't as easy to come by, or are they? No, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. That's like, you know, if it's sexuality there. is a part of you. Sure. I guess like addiction is a part of you, so that gets a little more complicated. But is it like you more draw intrinsically upon, a part of you? You maybe. Yeah, I mean like. It is for sure. I yeah. think you draw and and like you're supposed to as an actor, you're supposed to like draw on your sense memory. You're on supposed your experience to on your like, experience, and yeah. even if it doesn't line up exactly, right? You know, like it's like it's like you're playing a, a character who has I don't know, like just been fired from their job because they stole ten thousand dollars from the company. You know, it's like well, I've never done that, but I've done things that I'm ashamed of. Right. Sure. And, Acting. And I've been caught doing weird things or bad things that i shouldn't have been doing yeah so Make i can draw angel. upon <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was thinking of actually so your face getting so red so red <laughs> anyway um no yeah so anyway i don't know so sarah um where is maggie on your list of like dream roles is she even on it yeah she is yeah i mean maggie would be so fun she has you know she's constantly like on her feet trying to come up with like new tactics and you see that in her conversation that is what we did not see in that production that we watched yeah Yeah, like like the acting like like it was it was passable you know yeah yeah, yeah. it was a step up from like a community theater i like to close my eyes and just listen to it because i like tennessee williams like language Mm -hmm. but i was like i don't like watching these people so i kind of tended to do that by the end yeah but um no so i yeah i would love to play maggie is she like top five oh gosh oh gosh top 10 top 10 interesting i'm not old enough yet so you She's not that old though, right? I think it's like early thirties. Like early thirties, because maybe, maybe I thought, late I think 20s. Brick, yeah, I think Brick is late twenties. I still got a couple of years. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <sighs> That's uh, what was hard about casting Big Daddy, because I thought he should be older than he really is. He really is, yeah. yeah he's only sixty-five. Um. Anyway, I wanted to make one more thing about the language. One more note I forgot to say. Yeah. Um. So you know when Big Daddy's like talking about uh the wilderness and when he went to south africa oh my gosh and like yeah. all this stuff and his and like, like his like crazy like affairs he adventures had. Um, and like it's like this it's like this primal yeah kind of thing he's talking about yeah yeah um so i was like you know when you're listening to it you're like oh my gosh why are we talking about this what That's is what happening I but i think uh as i was like reading more into it and doing more research i think it draws upon like uh you know the like you said like this primal mm. like uh primal urges urges of the male uh right, right? like kind of, of like, the straight man energy right of like like brick like this is what you should be doing right right you know instead of like not even you're not even betting your own wife yeah because then one of brick's friends they talk about how you know he's in like uh north africa now or something and they learn like he's a sodomite <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Um, so it's like 
yeah, you go off and you go away to like do those, uh, you know, acts. Sow those wild oats. Yes. I hate that phrase. Oh my gosh, it's so bad. But yeah, so that's another thing where I guess I wanted to finish off by saying this is play. Sometimes Tennessee Williams can bother me because he does like pontificate so much. And I'm like, oh my gosh, please just get to the point. Say what you feel. I'm so tired of these yeah. circles. We've been talking about the same thing for like some kind of long conversations over and over. But there's so much like imagery there. um, Right. That's like really cool to listen to, to read, to uh, study as like an an actor. There's so much. I feel like this almost reads almost more like a novel Mm -hmm. of like how much there is to like dig into and unpack. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like we gave you a light. Sawyer's being really cute behind my camera. Sorry. Uh, we give you a light kind of intro into everything that is yeah. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Right. Um, but are you ready to cast the freaking play? Right. Are you ready to cast the freaking play? Let's cast the freaking play. All right. Who should we start with? May and Gooper? Yes. All right. Great. Okay. Who you got? So I have, let's do May first. Sure. I have Rachel Brosnahan. No. Yes. That's a good one. That's a good one. Thank I you. considered her for like, I was like, hmm, she'd be good in something, but I didn't. I put Katherine Hahn. From WandaVision, from... Yeah, oh my yeah, yeah. gosh. She's like the best friend in WandaVision or whatever. You know I love her. Who does she play? I don't remember. Uh, I, I don't Agnes. Remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And plus she's in a million other stuff. Yeah. But, okay, let's decide... Go- let's say Gooper and we'll decide the couple. Okay, great. Okay. So I have Nicholas Braun for Who is? Gooper. He's the character you hate on Succession, the cousin... Uh, cousin Greg? Yeah. Get out. Cousin Greg is Gooper. Nice. I have another Succession character. We've been watching Succession. We we just Did watched you know? season one. Um, uh, I have I have Kieran Culkin, who is Macaulay Culkin's oh brother. Oh my gosh. Um, ah, gosh, that would be really funny to put Greg, cousin Greg, and Rachel Brosnahan together because they're both yeah. like Greg is giant. He's like six four. Yeah. And Rachel Brosnahan is like so short. Super short. She's marvelous, Mrs. Maisel. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Plus, I feel like Catherine Hahn's kind of old. She's a little bit older. Yeah. I feel like it wouldn't be that noticeable. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I like yours. Yes. Nice. I think I like mine, too. Here, Culkin has too much, like, bratty energy. I know. And, like, I can't, Gooper's, yeah. like, the older brother. He's supposed to be a nerd. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm obsessed with him, though. For sure. Don't get me wrong. I will cast him in any other. <laughs> I, maybe. yeah, I was like, I'm going to find a role for this guy someday. Yeah. Um, Big great. Mama. Big Mama. I've got Kathy Bates, who is uh, Titanic. She is uh, she's the she's the old gal in Titanic. Um, she plays uh, Miss Hannigan and Annie. Um, oh, yeah. In the old one, the the, the the middle one, you know, with the you know, not the original Jesus. movie. Yeah, as, with Jesus yeah. as as Daddy Warbuck <laughs> as Daddy. Um, as Daddy. Uh, so I chose Helena Bonham Carter. She's a little younger. Uh, Age I don't her like up that. a little bit. I don't like that. Okay. I don't like that. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Interesting, though. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Who did you choose for the dad? I think the only choice. John Goodman. Sully. He's so old. He's 68. Really? Yeah. He was playing forever, though. I know. I, I really wanted to go with Brian Cox. No, oh I know, my he's gosh. Too old. We're gonna give him a role he's someday. Too old. He's but too, Brian Cox is too old, but he would kill him. Um, I chose Michael Keaton. What? No, he's like in his sixties. Interesting. He's too small. He's not physically imposing enough. But he's a sports dad. Yeah, for sure. He would be good. And I he'd think, be rich. I think John Goodman is would be better. I think John. I mean, like he—he's got the—he's like super tall, really big, broad dude. I, okay, 
I feel you really can strong have about big John daddy Goodman. and big mama. I want you to say that John Goodman's better than Michael <laughs> Keaton. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, fine. In this case, John Goodman is better than Michael Keaton. In this instance. Solid. Okay. Um, so we're we gonna go with Kathy Bates too. I don't really care about Kathy Bates. You can you can have you, Helen, Helen Bonham. You Carter. gave me a judgy look. I do, but as a, as I'm as I'm thinking more about it, I'm like I could I could see Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's like can be kind of annoying, but also like has yeah. a good heart. Yeah, for sure. You know, you always like her. She's not. You don't hate Big Mama. She she is supposed to be like a little like on the heavy side. Okay. Let's choose Kathy Bates. All right. Great. All right. Two, two. Great. Finals. Here we go. Who should we do, Michael or Maggie? <laughs> what? Did you finish with the cat on the hot tin roof? Finish with Maggie or finish with Brick? I say finish with Maggie. Okay. She's the one I had the most trouble with. Sure. So. <laughs> okay, Brick. I did Zac Efron. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> jock. It's not the worst choice in the world. Honestly. Jock. Hot Jock. Hot Jock. Give me a break. You would believe it in a w- world that, he's like, too... he's gay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. He's, he's... a good actor. Mm. Did you watch him in Ted Bundy? Yeah. That's pretty good. All I could think was, like, look at that. It's Zac Efron doing a thing. You're being hurtful to those guys. I know. I know. Let my my, my brick is not that good. Who? So you're going to probably win. It's Michael Zegan who plays... Uh, he plays Joel in Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, actually. Okay, we're going with my choice. In what world would he play sports? I mean, he's a really small guy. Yeah. I thought that would be interesting. Like a running back or something. I thought, I thought that would be interesting mm. with John Good, like the giant John Goodman, and then mm. Michael. That but he's the favorite. Right. But Big Daddy makes him feel small. That's where I was going. I'm not saying it's a perfect choice. I actually We're kind of like Zac Efron better. I, you know, I don't. I'm not in love with Zac Efron's acting ability. I want to push him. Sure, the you would. You you it. really would. You really. And would. I so know this kind of go against what I said as before. As long as you're direct. I'm sorry I didn't cast a gay male. Like, yeah, wait bad. a second. What happened to that? I kind of came to terms with it as we were talking. And that was before I cast. I mean, after I cast. If Zac Efron it. came out as gay, I'd be like, yeah. Yeah. So, if you guys have any other suggestions, always please tell us. Tweet at us. Just kidding. We're not on Twitter. I just said Zac Efron because he looks sporty, oh, and yeah. he's sporty-ish. hot. So very sporty. I don't know. Okay. Um, Maggie. Maggie. I have Carrie Mulligan. Interesting. Yeah. I think she might be a little old. She is a little old. She's she's thirty five. Yeah. But you could. I mean, whatever. It's whatever. Safe. You could. You could. Trim it down. Trim. Uh, you put her. I didn't. I that didn't wasn't mean the that. right word. I, no, uh, that wasn't the right <laughs> word. You could. I don't know. Age um, her down a little bit. I did Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie. Mm. They're very not, similar. Oh, I thought you didn't know who Margot Robbie was. <laughs> I and did I was blank. Like, I did blank for a what? second. You know, I love I her. Because I thought you were saying Saoirse Ronan, and I was like, what? No. So um, close. No. Um. Oh gosh, I feel like they're almost the same person. It's really hard to choose between them. She would be great. Both, would, yeah. I think, both would be really good. Yeah. No, for sure. They're both very, very talented. Yeah. I think. I think it. Marco Robbie's like almost like, like too much. Too hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Claire and I have talked about this. Where, yeah. Okay. Um, she only gets hot roles. Yes. Yeah. She typecast. And like Cat in the Hot Tin Roof, she's. She is hot. Yeah. And sh- Maggie marries up from her circumstances in life. True. And I believe that more from Carrie Mulligan than from Margot. I'm saying her looks help her mar- to marry up. Oh, I see. I see. Not that Carrie Mulligan isn't. I think I want Maggie. I mean, Margot. Great. I'll, I'll give it to you. Thanks. You're welcome. And Brick. Zephron. It was Brick to Zephron. What a I don't feel cast. great. I, I don't wish feel she great was about gay. That. I feel like or bi. <gasps> what about that guy who played, uh, ooh, Spock in Star Trek? What's his name? It's I don't remember, but he's gay. Is he handsome? Yeah. I'm into it. Let's do it. 
He looks a little bit like Spock, but. Is this because he has pointy ears? Or? No, he doesn't really have pointy ears. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, where's your, do you have your phone? Uh, no, it's. Dang it, it's recording us. <laughs> What's his name? I'm going to look it up. Can I look it up really quick? Uh, yes, you can. All right, all right, shoot. Because if you get it's this, happening. it's a tie. So there's a lot riding on Spock. Yeah, there actually is. He would be an okay. Um, I believe, you know. Zachary Quinto, or Quinto. Which other one? Would he be siblings with Nicholas Braun? I don't know who that is. Oh, that's the guy. Oh, I see. Uh, there we go. Great. Oh, sorry. That's probably really long. No, don't worry about it. Yeah, great. Great. He's from Pittsburgh. I thought he was British, actually. We love a guy from Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, he looks awesome. Good job. Awesome. Thank you. Just thought of that. Three to three. All right. Well, great. All right. Uh, what have you been watching, Sarah? Um. Well, we just started watching uh, last night Flight Attendant. It's on oh, yeah. HBO. It had like a surprise twist in it, and yeah, not not what I thought was going to be. I don't know. We were really into it. I was in, I was into it for sure. Yeah. So that's kind of my newer one. Great. You? Um, I've been watching. Um, I mean, like you had so much succession. time off this week. I know. So. I have hardly watched anything, honestly. Um, but uh. The Tiger, the Tiger Woods documentary on um, HBO Max, uh, super good. Uh, mm. If if Tiger Tiger Woods is a very fascinating person to me, um, his 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 rise, his subsequent fall, and then his rise, then again. rise again out of the ashes, mm, super good. Oh, I also remembered the Undoing, is pretty good. I just yeah. don't like a uh, murder mystery type thing that like it's the very obvious choice. Mm-hmm. You know. Like that person yeah, that did it, different. and we got that it little, kind of the like, whole time. Yeah, I was like, "Yep." Yeah, like I stayed up late because I thought it like, would be a, a twist. Give me a give me a Scooby Doo twist, twist at the end. At the end, and that's what I had a problem with in uh, Knives Out, but whatever. So, hmm. William. Yes. Uh, do you feel hot today? Um, judging by the fact that it is like negative four outside, I'm gonna go with no. Very I do fair. Not. But you got to stay home all day. I did get to stay home all day, but that doesn't usually make you feel hot. It makes you feel kind of like sometimes Bleh. I feel hot. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sarah, do you feel hot? Um, you know, actually, I felt pretty good today. Uh, yeah, that's basically all I gotta say about that. Great. I don't know. You have those days where you wake up and you're like, yeah, that's gonna be a good day. That's that's how I felt. So yeah, I feel pretty hot. What's your crush? Um, my crush is actually a very big crush. Um, it's a very powerful experience wow. for me. Um, really excited. I love driving on the highway in this nice weather, of course. Um, to "Pray for Me" by Kendrick Lamar, um, from the Black Panther soundtrack. Oh, it's it solid. Is, it's a it's a religious experience. It it has really changed me. It feel, <laughs> it makes me feel so powerful and so like in control of my life when like it. I feel so not in control most of the time, but sure. when that moment happens and I'm just like blaring it. Do you listen to that on the way to work? Um, like most of, most days. No, I mean like it'll have to pop up on my playlist, and I'm like, right, gotcha. "Fuck yeah, I need this right now." Whoa. <laughs> um, just that's how passionate <laughs> I feel about that. <laughs> Will, what's your crush? Uh, my crush is warmth. Is that cliche? It doesn't matter. It has been um, very cold really in Kansas. Cold. As, well, uh, across the whole dang United States, actually. Sure. But especially in Kansas. I'm just kidding. Yeah. If you're north of us, we apologize. Sarah? Some of the worst. Are you mad at me? No. Solid, William. solid. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Are you mad at me? I'm not, actually. Good. Not even a little bit. I love it. I love you. Okay, um, look, <laughs> we're on YouTube now. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Find us, the Playwrights Podcast. Anywhere you listen to your podcast. Anywhere you listen we're to there. your podcast, yeah. Um, give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Give us a comment. Give us a comment. We love you. Uh, we love doing this. And yeah. And we're going to keep doing it indefinitely, you know? It's fun. It's fun. Uh, so. so thanks for tuning in. We hope you learned a little something. We hope uh, to hear from you and – We'll let you know what next play the play is next week um, via Insta and Facebook. Yes. Um, so thanks again. We love yeah. you. And good night. Good night. <laughs>